Hello, everyone. For those of you who haven't joined us today, welcome to the CEA's Conversation Webinar Series. My name is Diana Dominique, and I'm the Director of the Customer Council here at CEA, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We have worked with our corporate partners to develop this conversation series that focuses on current and future challenges faced by our industry. Today, Bill Leisure, who's the president at ClearPath, and a 25-year utility and contact center expert will join us with Mika Peterson, who's VP of Product Management at Procedure Flow. They're going to talk about how utilities can train remotely and adapt during COVID-19. We've explored a number of customer-focused topics as part of this conversation series, and I'm really looking forward to discussing this issue as well. As you know, utility contact centers have been under immense pressure to find new ways to support the millions of Canadians who, under, who, are, who are under financial pressure. This has driven the need for new billing and collections rules and increased training of staff, all of which now needs to be delivered in a remote environment. In this session, we will share lessons learned about how to deliver effective and engaging remote training. You'll also learn how to quickly train on highly complex processes and a proven technique of how to reduce your training time. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. We're going to do some polling as part of this webinar, so you'll see the polling pop up on your screen. And I really encourage members today to participate. We'll also have time at the end of the webinar to ask any questions that you may have, so please feel free to use the chat function. And then we'll send out a survey afterwards to seek your feedback on thoughts on this webinar and anything else you would like to explore as part of this conversation series. So Bill and Mika, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. So please go ahead. Thank you so much, Diana. So Bill and I are here and it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I'm up here in St. John, New Brunswick, in Canada. And Bill, where are you at? So, good afternoon, Mike. I'm based here in Atlanta, but uh, for our webinar this afternoon, I'm actually coming to you from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I'm kind of on project at the moment and uh, and enjoying the weather here, but uh, but looking forward to the webinar. So it was uh, minus two Celsius this morning, so Bill's <laughs> just trying to rub it in there a little bit. Um, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> for an intro, for a really quick intro, uh, my name is Micah Peterson. I work at, in the product space at Procedure Flow. And uh, what we have is a product that helps with scenario-based training and visualizing information so that it's much easier for and faster for agents to come in off the street, start getting what they need in terms of their scenarios and exceptions, and then take that out and start doing work in a quality way. So that's been my life since about 2012, and uh, we're having a great time doing that at Procedure Flow. Bill, why don't you introduce yourself in terms of your uh, your run at working within the contact center industry and then more specifically within within utilities as well. Sure, thanks. Um, so just by way of background a little bit, uh, I fell into uh, utilities and specifically contact center and utilities uh, a little bit by accident. Um, I suppose my, my first job after college um, was working for Florida Power, running around in people's backyards, uh, you know, working with the ground crews and changing out poles and things. Um, but uh, really for about the last 25 years, it's been much more in the contact center and the technology space. So I uh, so spent some time working for uh, Genesis on the contact center side and, uh, and working with a number of utilities in that way. And then really for about the last 10 to 15 years, um, uh, taking on a little bit of a specialization around building new contact centers for utilities kind of from the ground up. And there's two that we're gonna talk to uh, or talk about today. One with, um, Philadelphia Electric, which is part of the Exelon okay. of utilities. And then the other, uh, like I mentioned, I'm actually here in San Juan now, uh, working with the utility company in Puerto Rico. And uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Awesome, looking forward to that. Um, Bill, I, just right out of the gate, I know that there's there's three main points. You and I have worked a little bit in the past and I and I know a little bit of your emphasis in terms of helping to make the training as great as it can be, but also shorten the training time. 
And so why don't you just give you three highlight bullet points that we'll keep referring back to throughout the presentation right. and talk, you know, just we'll talk about that briefly and then maybe jump into a poll here. All right, so we're ready for our, our high tech approach. Um, so <laughs> that we're really gonna talk to today, one is making training relevant and making sure okay. that it ties back to the, the trainee's job and is meaningful for them. Two is all about engagement, because if the training is not engaging, then uh, then folks are not going to retain it and you're, you're not going to have an mm -hmm. effect. Training. And then the third is actually my favorite. Um, it has to do with training to the resources, meaning instead of trying to cram everything into the heads of the students that you're teaching, uh, you train to the job aids and to the resources so that everyone has the information that they need at the point of need during their day-to-day -day job. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how we do that and how that shortens training time and um, and actually improves engagement and relevancy at the same time. Awesome. Um, so those are great points. Um, I just wanna pause here and um, what we're gonna do is a, a poll. And so um, Danielle, if you wanna bring that up, um, the first one, the question should be something to the effect of, have you done a remote training class yet? And so we'll just give everybody sort of an equal opportunity to see where everyone is that with this uh, we've had you know since march really to start moving out and be more remote and then we i'm hoping that everyone's had a chance to maybe get new recruits and train a class remotely and really interested in seeing um, whether that has happened yet or not and then also if you just wanted to go into the chat comments questions area and just type in like maybe you're doing a variation where you you bring people in for the training and then send them back home again. I've heard of that happening, um, if you have some sort of unique take on that. But just go ahead and try your poll out. And then when we see that slowing down, we'll post the results. Oh, it looks like we've got some results here. So looks like the bulk of people have finished um, at least one training class remotely, but then we also have 22% of folks that just haven't done one yet. And like I said, maybe creatively you're trying to figure out how to run those training classrooms if it isn't remote and so um so the next thing i want to just throw out there too is in your questions or in your ability to contact us through this uh, go to webinar tool if you could just let us know um what are the challenges that you're facing with remote training and as we start to see those come in it'll give us a little bit of an idea of how to shape today's talk for you um so we're going to use bill's three big things and hopefully get you guys will get lots of value as we talk through that um, but we also try to in the question and answer period at the end um, answer any specific questions that that you don't feel like we've addressed in our chat here so with that bill i want to just sort of get you to go right into your first point which is how do you make content relevant and what does relevant mean and why is that important to agents yeah so so in order to speak to this um, we're, we're trying to make this webinar actually fit our, our own uh, philosophies a little bit, and uh, we'll try to make sure that this content is in fact relevant and engaging. Um, but uh, I want to do that by talking through these, these two use cases, the, the two last projects that I've been working on. Um, the one was last year with Philadelphia Electric, and we were in the process of moving the contact center from one outsource vendor to another. And that meant that we were going to have to hire and train uh, between 200 and 250 uh, brand new agents from scratch. Um, and we didn't have the COVID challenge that we have today, so we at least had some in-class training uh, available. But, uh, but still, you're training a, a large number of agents on some fairly complex processes in customer mm -hmm. care and financial call center, taking payments and handling bill inquiries and, and that sort of thing. And, um, and so the first theme around making sure that it's all relevant um, was a challenge that we faced, um, and I'll switch over to uh, the next slide that I've got and see if that works. There we go. Um, the challenge that we were facing is that while Philadelphia Electric had very good content, um, it was not immediately obvious to a student how it related to their job. There were lots okay. and lots of rules around payment arrangements and um, you know, all sorts of different processes, but the documentation was delivered 
as a set of Microsoft Word documents. There were dozens of modules, uh, many of which were, as you can see on this one, uh, this example, 51 pages. Most were 50 to 100 mm -hmm. pages long. It was a lot of text. Uh, it was very hard to consume. And so a couple of the things that we did is that we first took the documentation in its current form and we said, let's just tie this back to the high level processes and bring it back to the job descriptions. And mm -hmm. so we did that by building out high level process flows so that everyone taking the class could see where it fit in context of all of the other things that they were being asked to do. Um, and then as we'll talk about more in just a little bit, we actually transitioned from those flow diagrams into scenario-based training and simulation-based training where the, the goal of the training was much more around the application of all of these rules and things. Instead of just going through book learning and memorization, uh, we did a lot more around role play and, um, okay. and that made a big difference for us. So essentially, if I, if I play it back, you had uh, you know, 24 modules, 50 pages a piece, that's a ton of, you know, it's like a binder about this big, right? And and no real necessary flow to it. So you were going through that and sort of applying the what, why, how, you know, what are we learning about? Why is this important to me? And then how do I go about doing that? So restructuring a lot of that information for Pico, is that right? Yep, exactly. We actually didn't change any of the content. It was just the the delivery and the context around it so that it was much more consumable and and much more relevant. Right, and uh, and relevancy I think can also be a tricky subject in, in in terms of like, I mean everything is relevant to an agent in some capacity at some point on the 500 to 2,000 different call types they're going to take, but it's really helping to with the within the learning range of you know getting them to be able to handle some Pareto rule of 80% of the calls. You know what what is the absolute thing that I need to know for the next call coming in and making sure that 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 they care about that, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah. So that next point then, making the content more engaging. So talk about that a little bit more. How did you accomplish that? And um, yeah, just within that PICO context, how did you do that? Yeah, so um, a, a number of different strategies to address that. You know, uh, over the years, I've heard a couple of different things about training in general. One was a, a quote that stuck with me was that training was about as interesting as wet cardboard. Uh, heard another one that uh, was supposedly one of the highest compliments around good training, where the students said that this was not nearly as bad as we expected it to be. Um, <laughs> sometimes training is not always the, the most glamorous at the start. Um, but what we did is we came in and we said, look, if we're gonna start out with um, scenario-based training, Almost from day one, we had the agents um, adopting their role. We did a lot of role-based play um, where it wasn't so much reading the documents. It was right from go. We had the flow diagram in front of them. Um, and I'll show you this a little bit more when we get into even the use of the software. But right from the first day, the students would learn the flow of a call uh, and then we would begin role playing, which kept them engaged right from the start. Uh, and then the other couple pieces that we added to that was um, more of the, the gamification side of it. Um, so they would start role playing between themselves. And then also we would introduce some other tools. Um, like I know you and Mike and I, you and I have talked about like Mentimeter and Jeopardy types of tools. And I think you had a couple of others on your list as well that you wanted to share. Yeah, um, I think, the, you have the, the big bucket of simulators, which you could have a, a whole conversation around what technologies and things can enable you to, to run simulator applications, which gets you into scenario based training. Um, but yeah, on the fun side, definitely if we talk about engaging stuff and if you wanted to just take your existing, you know, training curriculum that you're doing and just energize it and make it really fun. Um, the, the three or four that really stood out to me were one was a guy named Fiaggi. Um, T H I A G I dot com, really the gamification guru, um, and as it pertains to training. And so he's got a resource page with just lists and lists and lists of games that you can swipe from him. Um, uh, you ever hear the acronym swipe? 
steal with integrity and pride. <laughs> and, oh, okay. and so it's like, <laughs> just go swipe all his stuff, you know, free resources. And then uh, on the on the actual game platform side, Kahoot, I think, is fairly popular if you haven't heard of it. So K-A-H-O-O-T. And these are being put into the chat window here, I think, for everybody as well. Um, and, and then Trivia Maker, which is a competitor, I think, with Kahoot. But I found it had Wheel of Fortune and uh, Family Feud style. And so you take your content, put it into those games that everybody would be familiar with from, you know, primetime game show days back in the late 90s. And and, uh, and then you can just have fun with your class via Zoom, you know, through this remote period. Um, and so TriviaMaker.com, I thought, stood out to me as a really simple tool that was very effective and we compete with uh, with Kahoot. Um, and so, so th I just want to throw those out there just as kind of, uh, if you hadn't heard of those, you can go play with them. And uh, regardless of the age of your audience, I, I think it's always important to, uh, you know, just have some fun, right? So so if yep. we had everybody in this webinar, our webinar is compact, we're compressing, we're trying to do everything. But if we could be really meta with this, we would be able to see everybody's faces. We'd all be in a, you know, a Zoom room together or whatever. And then we would play some of these games and, and reinforce the points that you and I are suggesting today. Um, so, so that I would definitely jump all over that. Yeah, the, I know the tools have come really a long way. Um, you know, even just in the last couple of years around gamification. The one other uh, thing that I remember is that um, Mentimeter was a tool that we really enjoyed. It was kind of like Kahoot, but a little bit more um, like PowerPoint in its ability to to have slides and convey information. Also, but um, but then when it came to um, recording the progress of students, um, some of those tools don't yet have the ability to track the responses back to individual participants as well so we still ended up with something like a survey monkey for creating tests and quizzes for for tracking right. progress so okay. hopefully for evaluation and stuff yep. um so here i do want to talk about simulators a little bit more and just before we do that i'd love to get a sense of where everybody's at with simulators and what we mean by that i guess so you might have um like a staged production environment and so you're able to maybe use staging or a replicated live environment if you're using like CCMB or SAP or something. Um, and then maybe you just have simulator applications like uh, Adobe Captivate or Oracle UPK. Um, there's, a, there's other WalkMe, there's a whole bunch of other sort of uh, application walkthrough applications in that space. And so we'd love to get a sense from you guys of where that's at. And, uh, and so kind of the, the poll here is, is it's leaning one way, but it's kind of thinking about it in two ways, which is, do you have a system training sandbox slash simulator? So you just, do you have one at all? What does it look like? And then um, separately, just to think about this is, is it working? So it's a lot of times these will, the live replications will go out of date and the buttons don't work and you can't do the things that you needed to. And so while everyone's answering that question, um, Bill, do you want to just talk a little bit about the importance of simulators and, and what that meant for the projects you've been working on? Yeah, so um, so at Philadelphia Electric, um, you know, we started the, um, the first couple of classes with in-class training, and we weren't using the, the simulators and the role-based training as much. And we kind of, uh, I guess you could say we learned a lot throughout the course of the project. And, um, and then we became heavy users of the simulators toward the end. Um, we were a little bit lucky in that we had a copy of production that IT was able to provide us with that mm -hmm. had um, that had real live production uh, data in it. So we were able to identify accounts that could meet just about every scenario that we needed. Um, mm -hmm. But because it was in a sandbox environment, IT was able to roll it back to its previous setting so that every day we could run through classes and we could actually go into the uh, the environment and the, the CRM platform and we could make changes and we could watch students actually interact with the screens and go through the process exactly as they would um, in a mm -hmm. live environment uh, and then reset the environment to a state from the day before and then continue to run through those same exact scenarios over and over again with different classes. So um, if you have that capability that that was um, that was very, very useful for us. So we have our poll back here, and it's a little bit of a spread. The 40% is they have a replicated live environment or sandbox. Some are doing screenshots, some are doing nothing for simulator, and some have a simulator uh, for the live environment. Um, 
And so like maybe that could mean like a dummy account within the live environment that maybe you can play with uh, yeah. at a trainer level, perhaps an agent level. And so um, how important was that for Pico? Like being able as an agent really soon, like as soon as possible, being able to access those simulators and touch it. How important was, was that for them? Yeah, I, I don't know how you would put a measure to it, but it, I will say that, you know, it was, um, it was a, a huge difference for us, not just in the effectiveness of the training, but also the amount of time and effort that went into the preparation for the training. Because without that environment, um, we were spending a lot of time trying to come up with use cases and scenarios and trying mm -hmm. to prepare the test data. And it's amazing how much time and effort you can spend um, just creating the data to get ready for these scenarios or trying mm -hmm. to imagine scenarios where if you can take and create a sandbox or a copy off of a live environment, it becomes very easy for your subject matter experts to go through and say, oh, here's an example of a high bill. Here's an example of yeah. a case where they had a medical condition, you know, and, and you can run through all the different edge cases and, and cherry pick the scenarios that you want and then just rerun those exact same scenarios. Yeah, 100%. Um, so that, like, I'll just want, I just want to echo that in all of the work that we've done with different companies over the years, the, the better your simulator environment, it not only is a great relevant and engaging experience for the agents because it's close to what they're going to do when they're doing the work, but it makes things faster because the faster you can get your hands on it and actually run through real scenarios, the faster you can start doing real work. And so if this hasn't been a priority for your company to get you that environment, then I would just get all over that, especially during remote training, because now you need it all the more because remote training is just, it's not going to be fun. Right? Like I, I think generally speaking, you don't know if people are playing games on your iPhone. You don't know what they're doing. Like, I don't know what you guys are doing while we're talking, right? You can be checking your emails and that's boring, whatever. And so if that, if you're doing that to me, they're doing that to you. And so the, the more hands-on it can be and the shorter it can be, you know, the better off you're going to be generally speaking. So um, just before we transition to your last piece, because I want you to really sort of finish this out with showing us some scenario based stuff that you've done. Um, as we're gearing up for that, I just wanted to pop in here with a few of my, my, here's my paper with my tips here. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can get this. So I have about five points that I want to make here. And the first point is you want to create scenario flows. So you just have to sit down and do that work. What are the 100 to 1,000 different kind of calls that we get from everything from a, a invoice inquiry through to I'm move, I'm move in, move out, whatever it is that you're doing, what are all the scenarios and then what are the associated exceptions? And you just gotta start mapping that out because you're gonna have to train to that one way or another. Um, the second is to get away from slide decks entirely, memorization, lecture style. Like we said, if you can get a simulator and start running people through these scenarios, then that's gonna be a lot more engaging. It's gonna be faster. You need to, as part of this, you can't abandon a lot of the lecture style pieces entirely. So what we do is it's called backstory. So we call creating backstory and you put it in line with your flows so that people can consume acronyms and industry jargon and things that they're not familiar with along the way while they're running scenarios. And that way they actually care about the material when they encounter it. Um, the next thing is to create your caller situation and your personas. So you say, here's Bill, he's behind in his payments, you know, da, 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 da. And you, so you create that person, you create their situation, and then you start putting those out as exercises so that people can actually start running through those that live data. And the last one is to role play these scenarios and consume that backstory. So as you're as they're role playing and going through, and you're having this back and forth, um, they can actually consume the backstory material and see what these things look like. So those are my sort of scenario based training tips that I would just kind of that I'd put together and thrown out there. And now. Bill, let's transition over to you and you can take us through um, sort of your thinking on Pico and then transitioning into the work that you're doing now. Sure. So, um, uh, you know, Micah, you and I met after I had been through the Pico, Pico um, project and mm -hmm. I didn't know about procedure flow at that time. And, um, and after I learned about procedure flow, I looked back on that project and I thought, you know, how much easier it would have been if we had had procedure flow 
from the start when we needed to train all of those agents from scratch and we could have used procedure flow as um, as the part of the training and, and the way to deliver that. Um, so I'll, I'll show you in a minute, you know, why I think that. But now that I'm, um, you know, here in San Juan and working on the Puerto Rico project, we are actually using procedure flow right from scratch. And um, and so far the project is going really well, and uh, and we are in fact using it to the for those exact same benefits. So what I what I mean by that is um, if you look at what we had for Pico and what I've got on the screen, you know, we had binders of documentation and we did our best to make it more engaging and to, to add gamification and to do all those types of things. Um, mm -hmm. But what really would have been more powerful is if we could have started with procedure flow and built out those flow diagrams instead of in Visio or instead of in PowerPoint, um, the intent of procedure flow for anyone on the phone who hasn't seen it before is that you build the flows in procedure flow just like you would in any of those other tools but then those flows are available on the agent's desktop for them to use day to day um, and the way that we've been thinking about it is the procedure flow almost becomes a visual guide for the agents uh, as they go through their day-to-day -day jobs so what they're training to is exactly the same information that's in front of them uh, every day when they go through their work processes. And then because there's hyperlinks in the flows themselves, those hyperlinks tie into SharePoint or anything else that's on your intranet, or it ties back to some other knowledge management system. And this becomes the front end to the knowledge management. So instead of agents stopping what they're doing and then going to do a keyword search to find the job aid or the chart or the diagram that they're looking for, um, they follow the flow step by step. It shows them what they should be doing at any any point in the flow, and then you click on the link, and it takes you to that job aid. So again, you've got the information that you need at the point of need, and you train to that. So you don't train for them to memorize the job aid or even have it pinned on the wall of their cube or in a laminated in a binder. Right? It's it's right immediately in in front of them because the flow is actually on their desktop. So. Um, so if I go back to your, your three points, you've got make it relevant, which certainly we're doing here because this is what you're going to be working on with customers, make yep. it engaging. So we're moving them towards the actual call types that they're going to be getting running through scenarios. And then this third point of teach a man to fish. So it's, you know, after you leave training entirely, how are you going to find help? And we're actually taking you through how you find your own answers. Uh, versus trying to memorize everything in the classroom and hoping you remember later. Yep. And, and what's really interesting is in that scenario-based training and the role-playing, the role-playing in training is done where the agent has this flow in front of them. And right from the very first day they walk in, we're, we're now walking through and saying, okay, what do you do first? Well, I give the greeting. Then what do you do? Yeah. I authenticate the customer, right? And then all of that training then rolls straight into nesting where they still have these flows in front of them. And then day one, they're on the phones. And what we're seeing is that agents are much more comfortable being on the phone where, uh, you know, Pico last year, we actually had a good bit of attrition where everyone got through the classroom training. And then once they got on the phones, they couldn't make that transition as easily. And we had a good number of folks actually drop out of the training. And we're actually not seeing that now because what they've been doing for weeks in the training is the same thing that they're now doing on the phone. Awesome. Um, um, do you have a little bit of a demo that you want to take us through just to kind of bring this slide to life? I do. I was going to show one more slide just to kind of drive home the point that when you get into the flows, um, it's very easy to drop in not only uh, the boxes and the arrows and, and the flow itself, but also you can drop in graphics, so you can drop in charts or screenshots. For us, yep. um, we're using it for showing screenshots of the navigation because there are a couple of steps that require multiple um, you know, steps through the, the menu navigation to get to the right mm -hmm. screen um, or billing screen. So I wanted to show that piece and then also um, for- In Oracle, there's all kinds of little um, icons with no labels. Like these funny little pictures yep. right with like something with an arrow coming out of it or a little house or and it's like 
you click on it and important stuff happens, but how would you ever know what that button means? So a lot of times in procedure flow, we'll, we'll use, just throw in some of those little screenshots just to um, help them a little bit with the navigation. Yeah, exactly. So Micah, you can see the, the procedure flow that I've got up now? Yes, I can, yep. All right, so this is a live environment. And the last piece that I wanted to share with everyone is um, the part of the, the power of this really simple application is that uh, you've got the flow on the screen that everybody sees and the agents have it on their desktop and it's helping to guide them. Um, but then any agent or any supervisor or anyone that you give permission to can always click on your draft and make mm -hmm. a copy of the live environment, right? And then go and click on edit and suggest or recommend edits, right? And so what we've got is we've got our supervisors that are out on the floor that can say, I need to add the green box step to the flow. And it's just this easy to say, you know what? This flow works this way, but what I really think is that we need to make a change. And I wanna recommend that we add one more step here that comes in between these and you make the change and just like that you can then save what you're doing and close and the supervisor can say okay now i want to look at my changes and on the left side of the screen i can see how it used to look on the right hand side i can see my new proposed change and if i'm the supervisor i might not be the approver i might still have a, a centralized group in training that uh, that reviews things before it gets published. Um, but I might say, look, I'm adding the green box and I submit that for approval. Now, for me, I happen to be logged in as, as an admin in the system. So now it's showing the view that I would see as the approver. And I see kind of the mirror image. I see this is how the current view looks. This is the proposal coming in from the supervisor. And I hit approve. And if I approve it, then that change of adding the green box is now the new live environment. So if I go back mm -hmm. to my flow, yep. now everyone on the floor, all the agents uh, and everyone that's viewing these processes, and I always take it in the context of contact center, um, but we're actually talking with a number of groups that are looking at using this for back office and for um, other non-contact center processes. And, right. um, and so now you've handled all of your version control and uh, and everyone's working off of the same set of rules pushed out just that quickly. Yeah. And um, just for the icing on the cake, Bill, um, we didn't talk about this, but just to save time here, why don't you just click on that reports tab up there for a second? Okay. And I just want to let people know we've been working hard on taking collecting all the activity data, which is every click from every user, and then bringing that back for extra value so you can analyze that and help the agents either coach them individually or see in an aggregate way what they're doing. So if you click on like most viewed flows, what that'll do is bring up an aggregate view of what everybody's been clicking on, which flows get used the most, and then which flows never get used. So it's really interesting, right? Because if a flow never gets used, it's kind of like, do we have the wrong path there? Should we just get rid of it? Is it seasonal? You know, what is it? And then if it's being used a lot, we want to make sure we invest a lot in those areas. And so it really gives you a pulse on what's happening with your agents and where they need the most help. If you click back to the reports, again, there's two other ones I'll just mention quickly. The bottom one is unreviewed changes, which is when you click on it, it gives you a view to who's looking at their changes and who isn't. So you can see that Amy's falling behind here, um, but some of those folks have just one or two changes that they haven't reviewed. And so you can your coaches can go and say, hey, our expectation is that you're reviewing these changes as they come out. Um, and then if they're not, you have the ability to um, kind of check in on that. And then the last one, which is really cool, is is really specific. It's like if Bill made a mistake last week on Thursday that caused the customer a lot of issues, we can click on activity and say, was he in using the flows that we made for him? So you can click on Bill there. It shows a calendar view of when Bill's been in here. You can click on say today, which is the 13th, and you can see exactly which flows they went to, how long they spent in each section. And so this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of you can download all this data, you can see patterns, 
even see like, you know, which ways do people traffic the most? Where, do, where does everyone slow down the most, right? Maybe we need to fix the system in the process. And so that reporting data is really quite interesting. And this is, we're contrasting this with handing people out documents or books or things you pin on the wall, which you'll never get reporting data on, right? And so it becomes very interesting, this data, as you see your agents using this more and more. Yeah. And Micah, the other part that I was going to go back to is on version control. Uh, when people do have things pinned on their walls or in those binders, um, you know, we used to spend quite a bit of time running around and updating all of those papers and making sure that folks weren't working off of the old rules. And um, mm -hmm. this eliminates a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and maybe if you just click on view flows there, we'll just go back and show the change history so that people can see what that looks like. Um, there's the change history button and that indicates that there's a change that hasn't been reviewed yet. You can pull up that list of all the changes over time, click on any one of particular of those, pop in, see the side by side of what that is. And uh, and now your whole team, you know, 100, 150 people can be just completely up to date. If you use outsourcers, you can keep them up to date as well on this process changes. So it's very visual, very easy to use. Yep. Well, that's awesome, Bill. Um, any other comments on sort of generally speaking, visualizing, creating scenarios? Anything else you want to say on that? I think the only other one that I was going to mention before we leave the live environment was just the, the home page. Let me flip back to that. Um, so if I go back to the live one. Uh, the other thing that we found as we were going through this process is that procedure flow is not just useful for creating the processes and the flows themselves, but because you've got so much flexibility in having basically a set of pages that you can configure any way you want and they're in front of the agents, you can almost think of it as um, a very easy to manage, quick hit set of intranet pages. So, um, so I know that Pico and, and the Puerto Rican utility are, uh, are both working toward this, but the idea of putting together the idea of a homepage, where in mm -hmm. addition to the call flows that we were just looking at, you can also do some quick links out to glossary of terms or other uh, you know, resources. Uh, and then even things like, uh, remember that this Friday is half day and for here in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. there's no fungo in the break room, um, or these are your new teammates. So the ability to add images um, and yeah. just put any sort of real time messaging <clears throat> out to the group, uh, we're also finding a lot of use for. Yeah, where there's no cafeteria anymore where we can have, you know, that stuff, we have a bulletin board, you know, so it's essentially replacing that sort of uh, bulletin board tack, tack thing. Yep, and if you've got folks that are working from home, then this becomes even that much more important that you can get quick messages out to, to different groups. Awesome. Well, I think that's it on my end. Is there any last things that you want to hear before we take it open for questions? Uh, I think that's all I've got. Um, I'll go ahead and close this down for the moment. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if we want to go into questions, that sounds good. I see uh, Deanna coming back in. Coming back in. Thanks, Micah and Bill. That's uh, tons of interesting information. Um, a few things stuck out for me. Um, Bill, at the beginning, you said uh, training is as interesting as a piece of uh, wet cardboard or something to that. <laughs> 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 so you've really, you've really uh, changed that scenario for a lot of people. Just some, what were uh, the feedback from people who went through the training that you had with, uh, I think it was Philadelphia Electric? Um, so for Pico, you know, a lot of the feedback was that it was just fun. Um, you know, especially for us when we were in the process of bringing in 250 new people that you're hiring, you know, literally with with no experience in the job that they're moving into. Um, day one, everyone's very wide eyed. They're not sure what they're getting into. Not sure if they want that type of job. Um, and the amount of kind of team building and morale building and just fun environment that it created by doing scenario based training right from the start and having a tool like procedure flow to back it up where you're working off the flows you know that was really powerful because by the time we got on the phone you know only a couple of weeks later everyone was you know already in an environment where they're really comfortable with each other and um, and then even more so 
having the flow in front of you, it's like a security blanket, right? So when you transition into moving on to the phone for the first time, you're doing the exact same thing you were doing in training and you've got the information in front of you. It's like an open book test where all the answers are right in front of you, you know, so you know what to do at every step. So um, yeah, I, I think it was just, uh, it just made for a really fun environment for, for the training right from the start. That's great. And also you said it helped with attrition rates. Yes. Um, so it shortened the overall training time um, because there was um, so much less need for this really slow nesting period um, where, you know, folks were you know, much more comfortable getting on the phones because, um, because honestly, the, the type of training that they were doing was live environment or, or at least simulated environment, you know, right from the start. And, um, and honestly, I don't remember what the, the numbers were, but I, I want to say that, um, you know, out of a class of, you know, 25 students coming through, it was very typical that we would lose two to five off of each class where people would just not be comfortable getting on the phones because they had been in training for weeks just doing book learning or watching a presenter at the front of the room. And it wasn't until the third week or whenever we were making the transition that, uh, that they were like, wait a minute, this is really hard. I don't think I can do this. Um, so, uh, so if there were folks that were really feeling that way, you found out very early in the process. Yeah that was the case um, and you didn't spend as, as much time investing quite honestly in, in folks that you know weren't going to be the right for, for that kind of job um, but also I think a lot some of that attrition just came from fear like people weren't comfortable even trying to get on the phones and um, and this gave them a, a much easier transition into what they were going to have to do and any thoughts on how this translates ultimately to the to the end customer um, I think it translates a couple of different ways. Um, obviously, the end goal is just a, a better customer experience. Um, and so when I look at the agents that are, you know, using procedure flow and they've got that guide in front of them, um, we're seeing that there are fewer times where the agent has to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you on hold and raise their hand and call a supervisor over and get help. Um, you know, most of the time they've got the information that they need at their fingertips because you click on the hyperlink and there's the screenshot that shows you what part of the screen you need to go to. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of those things that they would typically need to reach out for help for are, are answered for them um, is probably the biggest piece. Um, and then the longer term piece is more like what Micah was talking about is that if you've got the ability to see patterns in where they're spending most of the time in their flows or, or that sort of thing, then you can use that kind of information to establish bigger programs and know where to focus, you know, which processes are really causing you the most problems. Mm -hmm. um, so, Di Di Diana, can I, can I share just a personal story on that for a second? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, answer? go ahead, yeah. <laughs> um, I just, <laughs> I have my telephone company, I've been, we've been renovating our kitchen and we need to move the modem from one room to another. So I called in and it seems like a fairly simple request to have, you know, to pay them 150 bucks to come out and move it. And the people that I'm talking to, so first of all, you're on hold to get to them. Then you get to them, simple request. And they're like, I got to put you on hold. You're on hold for 10, you know, 20 minutes for, for like to put in a schedule request for a truck to come out, right? And then they come back and say they can't do it somebody's going to call me, right? So that they, so we can set up the schedule. So I just, there's, I think there's a fresh, there's a frustration there that like if the customer can't even request the simplest things and the agent can't help them with that, then you're, you're not as a customer, very loyal to that company anymore. And I'm, and I'm, and you're looking for a competitor at that point. So I think it is a very dramatic impact on the customer experience. I, I agree, and that, that's what popped out in my head as well, is, is uh, frustrating. So it really reduces that frustrating factor, and like you said, Bill, um, increases the overall uh, customer experience. I also had um, a recent experience with my bank. <laughs> so, yeah, if we, can, if we can mitigate those friction points, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so just a question from a member, it says some utilities are looking to standardize on the processes provided by vendor software. 
um, you know, out of the box, um, thus standardizing their processes to what the vendor provides, how does teacher flow add value in these circumstances? Um, I don't know if Bill or uh, Micah would like to yeah, answer. I'm good to take a shot and then Micah, you know, jump in. Um, that is an excellent question. Um, so more and more we're seeing Oracle CCNB or, or other, you know, Oracle CCNB is just one of the majors in, in utilities, um, but other large platforms that are um, trying to kind of impose process in the software itself. Um, and sometimes that can be effective, but um, there are a couple things. One is that quite often comes with a lot of customization um, and, and sometimes cost. Uh, what we're seeing is that there's more benefit in having flexibility in the tool and then creating the guidance in a very lightweight third-party platform like Procedure Flow instead of trying to build um, a very sometimes rigid or funneled sort of set of processes in a very complex and expensive tool. Um, mm. So I, I know that's a very blanket statement. It's not always going to be the case, um, but uh, but it's much easier to change processes and rules in something like Procedure Flow than to go into um, the tool itself and make those changes. So you know that would be yeah. you know a big part of it for me. And and the other part, quite frankly, is that um, for as much as there are similarities across utilities, there are also lots and lots and lots of edge cases um, where they'll handle uh, you know, low income assistance programs differently and they'll handle the collections mm -hmm. process and what you do at 30, 60, 90 days differently. Um, you know, the rules from, from every single utility from one to the next change. Um, and it's very, very difficult for a CRM system to think that they can handle all of those nuances. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add on to what Bill's saying. If you think at a very high level, the reason that a contact center exists is because the business is outpacing the the organization's ability to automate those processes. So if everything stood still, we could just automate everything and you wouldn't need humans answering phones. And you know what I mean? And so if there are human beings answering phones, it's because the business is outpacing its ability to keep up with systems and regulations and you know products and marketing and all that stuff. So you do need something really nimble to connect those couple hundred people that are front line with your customers. And it, it can't all be in one system because you're crossing multiple systems. You're emailing Betty, you know, to process this form for this month. You have this extra Lean Six Sigma project you're working on and you want them to fill this out. There's just all kinds of extra things that have to be included in that holistic standard operating procedure view. Yep. Yeah. What yeah. a great question because I, I am seeing a lot of that in the market as well. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks guys. Um, another question. Can you get started with scenario-based training with very limited resources? You can. Um, uh, so the concepts, um, you know, you don't have to have a sandbox. You don't have to have a copy of production. Um, you know, you can build your scenarios and you can run it off of paper. Um, you know, so a, even if you don't have all of the, the resources and the IT backing and stuff, um, I would still definitely recommend that you take that approach in your training. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, you can kind of grow from there. Uh, you will have to spend a little bit more time um, thinking through what the test cases are going to look like and building out kind of your sample data uh, for those scenarios and you will have a little bit more of a challenge in kind of recording and tracking your your students performance as you go through but uh, but yeah you absolutely can do that all all paper based and, and somewhat more manual and i would say from if you say if you're using the word resource as in do i have enough people or staff to mm -hmm. actually invest in a project i would say on that that it's it's a person and usually a hybrid person who's also a trainer. So, and, and, and what you're, that one singular person, what you're doing is just sitting down and figuring out, it's probably never been done holistically is what are the calls that we get and what are the exceptions on those and mapping out that material. You don't, you can do it without procedure flow. Procedure flow just makes it easier 
Um, but once you see the scenarios and the exceptions, then you can really start to work with it. And that just takes one person. Sometimes you might interview somebody in the field just to get a better idea of what's actually happening out there versus what you think is happening. And then I would just say the Pareto rule. So the Pareto rule is like 80-20. So it's like, what are the 20% of things that we could tackle really hard that would affect 80% of the calls? Don't think about every process. Don't think about every scenario and exception. Think about the ones that are gonna give you the best bang for buck. So we often say most call volume plus most complexity, start with that and then build your list prioritized off of that. And so you could start doing that today. Um, and, and that would get you really far along in terms of shortening your training program and having something that is imparting confidence to the agent. Awesome. Thanks again, guys. Another question. What changes can you make to have some quick wins with remote training? You want to jump on that one, Micah, or can we take a first shot? Um, I'll, I'll just say... I'll go back to the games thing. If you if you want to talk about like a really immediate fun, you know, if we we're if we we're just talking about you're doing remote training now and you feel like it's a little bit flat, I would I would go this evening onto triviamaker.com if it was me, and I would take some of my content and fill it into a Family Feud or Jeopardy. Just try it on your next you know Zoom training meeting and see if it helps to liven things up. That's not it's not kind of holistically to everything we're talking about today, but I just think it's an immediate win that would tomorrow get you some engagement and excitement and then the i think the more medium term thing as we're talking about here is you can cut your training time by 50 to 90 percent if you move it more towards scenario based it's going to be more engaging more relevant and so to me that has to be the where you start working on that it's not going to happen tomorrow obviously you've got work to do but but you need to you know put the first foot in that direction and start doing more um you know, that that playing out of scenarios and doing role play stuff. So that that would be my my thinking. Yeah, and I guess I've got two that I'll add to that, Diana. One is um, I've really enjoyed having the multiple personalities on the screen at the same time in the, in the remote training. Um, I, I think if I look back to pre-COVID um, when we didn't use conference calls quite as much, um, it was almost always 100% there was just one presenter and it was PowerPoint and it was just one face talking to you for an hour. And um, and I think with everyone getting a little bit more comfortable with multiple faces and voices, um, it, it really does break it up and it maintains the interest. So I would say a quick win is um, on pretty much all of my online presentations now, we're going to multiple presenters even if it's just to have a different voice periodically and break it up. Um, and then the other is that um, I agree with Micah that if you're going to do um, some sort of a, a gamification or, or something along those lines, I would probably pick a tool where you can track the individual's users' responses um, and, and do as much as you can to get a baseline on what your folks know or don't know, right? Um, so I think uh, I think doing the a little bit of assessment through remote right you present some information and then send a poll or a questionnaire um, and uh, and then track back to you know which questions are most people missing the most right that type of thing i think that's um both of your feedback i think it's really important because you know who knows how long we'll be you know doing the the zoom and the go-to webinars um right now mm -hmm kind of you know we'll 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 be out of uh this format next year we, we don't really know so i think it's really important that our member utilities uh realize that too so so very good points um before we wrap up any final thoughts uh micah or bill i don't know that i've got anything else i think we covered uh you know the the couple of topics that that we wanted to get across um you know it'll be uh it'll be good to get a little bit of feedback and if the folks that are out there have any other questions in the chat that they want to follow up on anything more specific, you know, be happy to have conversations with you. I um, I guess the last thing that I'll just kind of leave you with is you might have come to this webinar today thinking that Micah and Bill are going to give you sort of general warm fuzzy tips on how to make training less boring. And I think that's the wrong way to look at it, in my opinion. Um, I, I really, truly believe that 
Uh, training is always going to be tough. And the, the generations that are coming up, they want to touch stuff. They don't want you to talk to them. They don't want to spend time in the classroom. And so if you're an agent and you want to make money, what you want to talk to customers essentially, right? You want to see what this job is about. And so the faster we can get them to actually doing the job and making money talking to customers, the happier they're going to be. And so for me, the game isn't how do you make training the most interesting? It's how do you actually eliminate it entirely and allow yourself to dream that way? Like, what if in one day I could have somebody taking calls? What would that look like and how do I get there? And once you start thinking that way, it opens up a whole new world of possibility. And then what, you know, what we're sort of intimating here is that scenario-based training is really one of the primary ways to do that. Jeff Toyster, there's other trainers out there that really recommend this as well. And so if you haven't ventured out into that scenario-based training space, we'd encourage you to, to start looking into it. And we're here to help if you want to talk to us, if you want advisory, if you want to try our software. Um, so just throw that out there. Thank you again, guys. Really, really appreciate your time today. Really interesting stuff. Um, and they have your contact information. So, and then we'll circle back with you as well. Uh, so have a great day. And um, all of our future events and webinars can be found on our monthly newsletter, uh, The Current Affairs, or you can go to the news and events section at our website at electricity.ca. Again, we really appreciate your time today and feel free to follow up with any questions um, to myself, Dominique at electricity.ca and have a great day.